So hello, Carrie. Hello, Jacob. How are you? I'm pretty good. I um, finished reading a book, uh, When You Reach Me by Rebecca Stead, and I am really excited to talk about this book with you. Yeah, me too. Um, Yeah, this is one that I would say, this one has like... I don't know. It fits together like a, a like a puzzle in a really pleasing way, and there are some interesting twists in the end. Yeah, there's some really interesting twists and nuances that I think if you're thinking about reading the book, um, you should do that. If you don't want to read the book, we're gonna spoil it all for you. So good luck. Yeah, uh, but before we get to that, uh, like. We usually tell people what the next book is so that they can list, read it if they want to prepare in advance. Um, but I don't think we'll do that this time. We're not going to do that this time. We're going to let y'all decide our next book. And there's a good reason for that. I'm going to visit you. Yay! <laughs> yes. Jacob's going to come visit me in North Carolina. I will meet the new cat. You will meet the new cat. The new cat's name is Hot Dog, y'all. Hot Dog is Crazy pants. My favorite kind of cat. I I think that I'm good with cats. I have had many cats <laughs> over my life. Uh-huh. A hot dog is a different kind of cat. Ooh. There's something coming. There's a new car on the horizon. It's coming very slowly. It makes a noise. It has kittens painted all over it. With a new kind of fur. Cleaner. But with a unique smell. So, Hot Dog is his own guy, and we're trying to figure him out. But he's awesome, and I can't wait for you to meet him. I can't wait to see you, and I can't wait to read whatever book people in this universe um, decide to force me to read. And it it could be a book that you think that we'll really like and have a fun time talking about. Maybe it's a book that you think that we'll really hate and we'll have fun talking about. Oh, that would be the best. If you can find a book that you know I'm going to hate, but is not about boys knitting, bring it on. (laughs) That's the preemptive veto. No, uh, boys don't knit or sequel. Um, yeah, so let us know. You can uh, reach us on the Facebook page or group. Uh, search for Love You Like Crazy. Um, or or on Twitter at LoveYAPod. Or on email. Uh, I think podcast at LoveYouLikeCrazy.com works. I don't know. I think it does. <laughs> I don't know. I'll make sure it does. By the time this is up. The thing is, Jacob, you take care of all that stuff and I just... <laughs> Get to talk about books. <laughs> I have the easy job. So anyway, let us know what you would uh, definitely like us, and and we'll we'll decide in the next couple of weeks. But um, yeah, uh, the other thing that I wanted to mention before we got to talking about the book proper is that um, you know that we're members of the Ear Trumpet Audio Network uh, of podcasts, and one of the other podcasts on the network. The Please Don't Send Me Into Outer Space podcast had me on to talk about the movie Soylent Green uh, <gasps> starring um, Charlton Heston. So, Carrie, uh, speaking of plot twists, do you know how this movie ends? Soylent Green is still people. Have you ever seen the movie? No, I have not seen the movie. I have only seen people talk about the movie. Yeah, I feel like this is the movie that... Um, you know, like people know the ending of Sixth Sense, but I also feel like people have mostly seen Sixth Sense and Soylent Green. I think people just know about because of Saturday Night Live, but it was, it's also actually a pretty good movie. And, uh, I had a good time talking about it to Joel and Sarah, the hosts of, or two of the hosts of Please Don't Send Me in Outer Space. Uh, the third host, Aaron was, was not present, unfortunately, but so if you want to hear me talking about this old movie, um, oh, I, I should say, so when, when I called, you know, I, I called them up via Skype because they're in California and I am the exact opposite of California. <laughs> Joel says, uh, Joel said, yeah, so, um, we don't really have a set introduction and it's, we don't really have segments or anything. And sometimes we go through the plot and other times we don't, it's really pretty free, free form. And I'm like, I'm home. <laughs> this is it. This is what I do. <laughs> So it was great. Yeah. Uh, so with with all that out of the way, let's let's talk to uh, let's talk about rather when you reach me by Rebecca Stead from two thousand nine. <sighs> 
this book? This is a book that you picked. I did. I chose it because we had both recently seen the movie A Wrinkle in Time, and we had read the book a while ago. Um, And so, um, as I told you before, I think this is sort of a both a loving homage to, to A Wrinkle in Time and also its own thing. And so I really wanted to sort of share this book with you that I'd read and really liked, but also sort of get your take on, you know, how you felt about this and what sort of emotions did it evoke in you, if any? Yeah, I mean, the Wrinkle in Time thing is kind of funny. I didn't really take any notes about that aspect of it, although obviously that's an important part of the book. Um, one of the things that I thought was kind of fun or, or funny about it is that, um, the way that the main character, uh, you know, Miranda, like she just loves the book so much and has read it over and over. Uh, you know, I kind of think of it as I would have at that age, to, you know, there were just certain books that I just read so much that they were basically, you could basically shuffle them if you wanted to, you know, the binding's all gone and it's just, yeah. Um, and so she has her way of appreciating it. And then Marcus has also read it and clearly has thought about it a lot, but he doesn't remember any, any of the characters names or anything like that. He's just like kind of fixated on the time travel aspect. Um, so I thought that was kind of, I just kind of thought that was sort of funny as a way of that different people can take things, different things from the same book. Well, and the other thing is, like, when, when Marcus and, and Miranda were, were talking about um, the book, it sort of became very clear that Miranda doesn't think or hadn't at the time thought deeply about anything. You know, her friendship with Sal, um, her her family this book she hadn't really thought much more than than what she saw rather than what other people saw um and i think this this whole experience um sort of made her sort of think more critically about how other people felt and also you know maybe about things like this book Yes, and there's. I have a lot to say about that. Um, but before I do, <laughs> another thing I want to say regarding a wrinkle in time is that it's also, uh, you know, you mentioned before we started recording, uh, you know, about the themes of friendship in it. And one of the things about this book is that it becomes this sort of unlikely agent of bonding between characters who didn't, who weren't otherwise necessarily friends, like Miranda and Marcus. Miranda and uh, Julia. Yeah. And ultimately, we we discover Julia and Marcus. They all kind of are brought together because they all love this book. But the, yeah, the thing about how, um, how Miranda starts thinking about other people more than herself, um, which is something that Marcus also kind of, goes through that process as well. In fact, Marcus tells, ultimately tells her, man, well, I'm jumping around this book, but in a terrible book, that's super appropriate, maybe. But it's totally not a terrible book, etc. cetera. <laughs> um, spoilers? Oh, sorry. Yeah. No. Um, right. Don't read the back of the book. Yeah. It's a book where they, where they talk about <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> wink, wink, nudge, nudge. Like, this is one of those books where, like, normally we're just like, we're just going to talk about it. There's no, you know, it's going to be full of spoilers. Don't worry about it. But this is one where I kind of, I want to be a little more careful about it. Because there are, like, a lot of twists in this book that are really fun to read. Yeah. You know, I, I enjoyed reading it a second time as well in close. Because then then the second time, the significance and meaning of certain things is is clear the second time around when the first time it also seems a lot of it seems kind of random until you know but nonetheless like i really do kind of encourage people like this is under 200 pages you can read it in an afternoon and i kind of recommend you do before you listen to the rest of this i honestly think so as well i think you know it's a really good book and to really you know sort of get what we're talking about without us you know we're, we're gonna try not to spoil things but there are things that are going to be spoiled um when we talk about this and I think reading it first and sort of 
appreciating sort of the experience of the book is going to be really useful because um, there are a lot of things where, you know, when I first started reading the book again um, for the for the first time, I'd read it a, a few years ago. I don't remember when it came out, um, but I'd read it around when it came out, which was 2009, so 2009. Um I'd read it around then. So I had forgotten a lot. And I remember when I started reading it again, I was like, wait, is this book written backwards? How is this happening? And it and it is, but it isn't. And I think that that's sort of, there's, there's a whole, like I said, experience to the book that's really, really fucking good. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> um. Um, anyway, but beyond that... Oh, what else do you have to say? Oh, just like, uh, so there's a point in the book, like early in the book, kind of the first incident that's discussed is this incident where this kid who Miranda has no idea who it, uh, who it is. And her friend Sal also has no, no, who it, I also has no idea who it is. Uh, but this kid just walks over, um, while they're walking down the street and punches Sal uh, and it turns out that that person is Marcus, who Miranda l- later gets to know someone. And at the, at the end of the book, Marcus describes what led up to that. And basically the situation was that the previous day, his brother was ha- getting beat up. Um, and afterwards, his brother was like, why didn't you do anything to help me? And Marcus says, Marcus talking to Miranda says, I wasn't afraid. I just didn't see myself as part of what was happening. Sometimes I'm thinking about stuff and I walk right past my own building. Um, Anthony told me one day you're going to have to hit someone and get hit yourself. Then you'll see, maybe, maybe you'll understand life a little better. And I wanted to understand life better to understand people better. So the next day I walked over and hit Sal. So he also like has this thing where he's, he realizes that he's disconnected to other people and, and Miranda does too, and she kind of does some things about it um, that don't involve punching people, but instead involve taking them to the bathroom. Which is also lovely. That makes me just feel so good because um, Miranda, you know, she's kind of a dick um, at the beginning of the book, you know, and, and I, it's hard to say she's a dick. She's maybe a typical, what are they, sixth grade girl? Yeah, sixth grade. Where they, you know, I think when I was six, six, a sixth grade girl, a lot of the my time in school was sort of spent trying to not get noticed. Mm-hmm. Because if you get noticed, you might get picked on. And so I think that that's sort of where she is. She's like, I've got my life and my life is good. I don't want to stray from that because then maybe I'm going to get picked on or maybe things won't won't be good anymore. Um, but then when she realizes like, again, when when I look outside of myself, things are still pretty great. And when I try something new, um, it's it's still OK. And I'm still, you know, I'm still me, but I'm a better me. Being a sixth grader is tough. <laughs> And being a sixth grader in New York City is probably really tough. Yeah. And, I mean, I kind of, I I had the same experience as you um, in reading the book and also, I I think, you know, more or less in uh, elementary school. Um, Although maybe it's a little different for boys, but um, this is going to, this is kind of random, but... um, there's this uh, British comedy team, uh, Mitchell and Webb, and they have this sketch called Are We the Baddies? Have you seen that or heard of it? I have not. So basically the setup is that they're basically these two, you know, they're basically two soldiers in essentially a Nazi army. Hans, I've just noticed something. These communists are all cowards. <laughs> have you looked at our caps recently? Our caps? The badges on our caps. Have you looked at them? What? No. A bit? They've got skulls on them. (laughs) Have you noticed that our caps have actually got little pictures of skulls on them? I I don't, so... Hands. Are we the baddies? They just sort of struggle with this question of, like, wait, maybe they're the bad guys here. Um... And there was kind of a point in the book, because like at the beginning, I totally 
uh, I totally connect to Miranda. Like when I was in elementary school, I was like a quiet kid who was like not really paying attention to things around me so much and just just kind of off in my own play world and i you know i definitely i loved a wrinkle in time and everything but there's a certain point in this book and i think um it's roughly where like she um she and she is passing out diagrams for in math class and act and quote accidentally end quote rips julia's before she gives it to her and crumbles it and uh and sees that alice evans has to pee and doesn't do anything about it and i'm like wait a minute is she the bad like is she the bad guy in this book um and she kind of is and kind of the ultimate like the turning point in the book is new year's day when she suddenly realizes that she's been totally kind of just totally self-absorbed and starts actually trying to do nice things for you know take po- positive actions yeah for people around her and and yeah like it really touched me and I really uh, got a feeling out of that you know as as I sometimes do from these books jealousy is a hell of a drug um, and I think that's where she was I mean she's she sees um, Anne Marie's house and her family and she's she's jealous and her best friend has left her and so she's mad and she's jealous um so I mean I, I see why she would do that but I hate the fact that she did mm-hmm. you know I, I, I know it must be tough to be like wait my best slash only friend just isn't talking to me anymore and I don't understand why and he won't talk to me and I'm I'm mad and I'm hurt. And so I'm, I'm acting out like I can see that, but I, I hate that for her, but it's also, you know, when you're sixth grade, you're a fucking dumb, dumb. Oh yeah. No, totally. <laughs> so, I mean, I don't know. I, I don't know if I think of her as the baddie, but I think of her as, you know, like maybe not the best. <laughs> right. Well, maybe they're the skulls of our enemies. Maybe. But is that how it comes across? Um, there's definitely one person in this book that is the baddie that I just do not like. Just one person. Tell me. His name is Jimmy. Oh, yeah. And he runs a sandwich shop. Yeah, he's a racist asshole. He's such a racist asshole. So, Miranda had been calling Julia Swiss Miss. Yeah. Because... Julia liked fancy chocolates and had been abroad and had talked about it at one point. And Miranda somehow fixated on this and thought, like, this is all she ever talks about. Um, So she called her Swiss Miss. And so when they were working at the sandwich shop and Jimmy's bank of $2 bills in his um, Fred Flintstone bank got stolen, he immediately thought it was Julia because she was African American and haha Swiss Miss means hot chocolate and I was like oh oh that guy's a fucking asshole not only would he not give those kids like more than cheese sandwiches he was a racist fuck yeah oh he was a baddie I just did not like him yeah and it's like it's telegraphed I think one of the first times where we actually see them interact with him he does the like ching chong chinese voice oh yeah he's an asshole yeah that's no good um but that's like i mean everything this book is like so compact but also everything there's so much foreshadowing in it like the uh that incident leads to the later thing where he uh, accuses julia of being a thief because she's african-american but then you know when if we look at book bag pocket shoe yes you know bag wouldn't have happened right because well a bag wouldn't have happened <laughs> yeah because um she, uh miranda finds a series of cryptic notes the first one is in the library book uh, the second is in a ba- is in a bag of bread and then the third note was in a, her pocket. And then the fourth note was in a shoe. Yes. The shoe that had gone missing from their house months earlier. Yeah. Which 
Mm. This book. It is. Um, you know, other little, little, like everything. So, um, one of the sort of puzzle things is that Miranda's mom, uh, has wanted to go on the $20,000 pyramid show hosted by Dick Clark, um, to try to win enough money to make, you know, a difference in their, their life that she wants to go on a trip to China and to get wall to wall carpeting for Miranda's room and get a new TV. Uh, her boyfriend wants to get a sailboat, <laughs> uh, I think. And, um, you know, so that's the $20,000 pyramid is like a person and a celebrity celebrity trying to, and one of them gives clues and the other tries to guess what the clues mean. You are, sir, to describe these things associated with a murder trial. Ready? Go. Uh, the group of people that is... The jelly. Fate. A weapon. Uh, the gun. The whole uh, knife. Sharp. Someone who saw the crime. The witness. So there's this. Um, what you take before you um, the this whole like puzzle kind of figuring things out thing going on there as well. There's the question of who left the rose for Anne Marie. But Miranda figured it out. Miranda figured it out. Miranda figures out most of these things. But it's all like eventually like oh duh, of course it was Julia. Right. Because Julia feels like. Just like Miranda did, like she's losing her best friend. Mm -hmm. And I think that's sort of when Julia, I mean, when Miranda starts like realizing that she can put everything back together or and or make it better. Yeah. The other question is, why does Anne-Marie only eat the cheese on her pizza? That gets eventually, that eventually pays off mm -hmm. in a big way. Um Man, just a good book. I'm really glad you liked it. Like, I'm really glad. I, I thought you might, but I was like, I don't know, because it's a little more juvenile in some of our other books, and maybe he won't like it, but I'm really glad you did, because I, I remember sort of the first time I read this book, when I was done, I was like, holy fuck, <laughs> what just happened here? Mm -hmm. I mean, let's just redact some shit, because I need to talk. Yeah. So, well, yeah. So, I think... Um there is like uh, there are some major developments in the last i don't know quarter of the book maybe yeah and, and uh, we want to talk about them so if you have listened to what we've had to say so far and you think hmm this sounds like it might be a good book that i should read i really do recommend that you pause this now and go off and read the book which is as i said quite short under 200 pages and then come back and listen to the the rest afterward um or if if it doesn't sound like a book that you want to read, then you can just listen and not worry about it. But that's that's where we are, I think. Okay, so throughout the book, um, you're you're reading it, and and there's a homeless man outside of Miranda's building, um, who's the laughing man, and he's often seen, you know, kicking or has his head under a mailbox, um, and. There's also been a naked guy that has been seen streaking. like, And you're like, how does this tie into the book? But how does it tie into the book? Well, it turns... So, um, kind of the, the thing that happens at the end of the book is that um, Sal is going home from school and sees marcus right he sees marcus marcus is like coming towards him marcus is not paying any attention and doesn't even see that sal is there but sal sees him and starts running and everyone sees that he's running and it looks like and he's about to run into the street and so they all start yelling at him marcus is running after him to stop him sal sees that marcus is following him and runs faster and Sal runs into the street and is about to get hit by a giant truck when the laughing man goes into the street and kicks him out of the way and gets hit by the truck instead and is killed. Um, and so, yeah, so that happens. And then like right at that moment or right after that moment, um, Miranda finds the last note. Right. Because, uh, it, the shoe, the laughing man's shoe gets knocked off and Miranda makes the connection between this phrase that the laughing man had chanted over and over, which is a book bag pocket shoe. 
Mm-hmm. And the, as we said, the first clue, the first note was found in a, a book, the second in a bag, the third in her pocket, and the four, And so she looks in the shoe and finds the fourth note. And she also re- recognized the shoe as being her mom's boyfriend's shoe that had been stolen from their house. Yeah. So she, I guess at that point, she's starting to put things together, but not quite yet. Right. And the notes, basically what the notes are, are saying is... They're all they're they're all very short. I mean, I guess I could read them. Or do you want to read them? Let me find the first one. Okay. We can take turns. Yeah. And I guess one of the things, like when the book starts, the mom is getting ready to go on the pyramid and they're talking about like preparing for the pyramid. But then as you go through the book, they're not at that point yet. So there's definitely like a weird shift in time that took me a little bit of t- time to figure out like where are we here? Yeah, that's true. It's all kind of a flashback. It's a flashback, but there's like different parts of the flashback. Mm-hmm. So it's like, here's the flashback of right before the mom, surprise, wins some money on Pyramid. And then goes to everything that happened that led up to that. And then past that. Yeah, because the the Pyramid happened after Sal got hit. Yep. That's right. Okay. So the first note, I found it. All right. M, this is hard. Harder than I expected, even with your help. But I have been practicing and my preparations go well. I am coming to save your friend's life and my own. I ask two favors. First, you must write me a letter. Second, please remember to mention the location of your house key. The trip is a difficult one. I will not be myself when I reach you. Yeah. And how could you read that and not freak out? And she shows it to her mom. Yeah. Is that before or after the, their house key was stolen? It was after. Um, right. Because before that, she had talked about being a latchkey kid and hiding the, um, the key in the hose. And when they got that, that's when the mom, because she actually says later, our key was stolen on Friday. And now Monday, we find a note asking where our key is. Right. So... The second note is um, she finds like partway down this bag of bread that she's counting up for Jimmy of Jimmy's Deli. And it says, Miranda, your letter must tell a story, a true story. You cannot begin now as most of it has not yet taken place. And even afterward, there is no hurry. But do not wait so long that your memory fades. I require as much detail as you can provide. The trip is a difficult one, and I must ask my favors while my mind is sound. A postscript. I know you have shared my first note. I ask you not to share the others. Please, I do not ask this for myself. And then the third note, um, which she finds in her pocket. Um, she, she shoves her hands in her pocket. She f- felt a bunch of old tissues. Um, and then a little piece of paper folded in half. She pulls it out. You will want proof. 3 p.m. today, Colin's knapsack. Christmas Day, Tesser Well. April 27th, Studio TV 15. P.S. Yawns do serve a purpose. They cool the brain by bringing air high into the nasal passage, which has the effect of increasing alertness. Right. So you want to break that down? Yeah, I do. Um, So 3 p.m. today, uh, she goes to Colin's knapsack and finds the the two missing bread rolls um, from the deli. On Christmas Day, she's given a first edition of um, A Wrinkle in Time uh, with the inscription on it, Tesser Well. Um, And then her mom gets a postcard later uh, for her pyramid appearance, um, which is on April 27th in Studio TV 15. And the yawns? Well, the yawns were, um, was that on her her science project or her, her poster. Yeah. That, that was the day she was, she had it. I think the day that Sal got punched. I thought so. Yeah. So, um, some of these things, you know, 3 PM today, Colin's snaps like, okay, that one's, that one's pretty close in the future. Uh, but the, the Christmas day in April 27th, that's a big time span. (laughs) Um, and so we know later that these things happen 
or we've known earlier that these things happen because we did know um, at the very beginning of the book about April 27th because the book basically starts with um, April 27th. Yeah. The first page of the book says, so mom got the postcard today. It says, congratulations in big curly letters. And at the very top is the address of Studio TV 15 on West 58th Street. After three years of trying, she's actually made it. She's going to be a contestant on the $20,000 Pyramid, which is hosted by Dick Clark. And then there's the date she's supposed to show up, scrawled in blue pen at the bottom of the card, April 27th, 1979, just like you said. So it starts off, this book starts off by like giving you this really cryptic thing. And so I feel like as a reader, you're you're going through the story in, in the same sort of like confused way Miranda went through her own story. You're like, I don't know what's going on here. I don't know what to make of this. I don't know if, if this is true or false or fact. You know, I don't know. Um, but I'm going to keep going because that's really the only way, you know, to find out anything. And I guess that's that's one of the reasons I really like the book is because it I feel as confused as Miranda must have. Mm-hmm. Anyway, um, and then there's there's one more note. Right, the note that she finds in the shoe. This is the story I need you to tell. This and everything that has led up to it. Please deliver your letter by hand. You know where to find me. My apologies for the terse instructions. The trip is a difficult one. I can carry nothing, and a man can only hold so much paper in his mouth. Oh, and and then you read. Sal was not dead. The laughing man saved his life. You saved Sal's life. You were the laughing man. You were the heap of something awful. You are dead. But at this point, we still don't know who you is. Not really. Right. We might have guesses. But we don't know. And there's one more. um, (coughs) One more clue. There's one more clue, uh, which is underneath the post office, the the, not post, the The mailbox mailbox where the the laughing man uh, slept. Because he always slept with his head under the mailbox. And so Mm -hmm. Miranda gets the idea of looking to see if there's something under there. And guess what? There is. Well, there's two things. So what's one of the things? The house key. And the other thing? A a picture of Julia as an adult. Yes. (sighs) And we're told at one point, you know, that it's okay. Oh, yeah, right. The laughing man says something. Yeah. The laughing man says a bunch of things that also don't make sense until you've sort of read the whole book. Oh, she. he says, I'm an old man and she's gone now. So don't worry. Okay. Yeah. But what's the other thing that she says later? as She's she's writing things. Um, oh, yeah. So Marcus and Julia, I think about how she whipped her diamond ring off and used, and used it to explain the way she seems time. And the way Marcus stared at her afterwards, maybe he was thinking he wasn't alone in the world after all. I get this rush of happiness, this flood of relief. Marcus won't be alone. He'll have a partner. He'll have Julia. I'm wiggling out from under the mailbox. Some guy with a big black dog is looking at me funny. And I suddenly remember what you said to me practically on this exact spot the afternoon I gave you my soggy cheese sandwich. I'm an old man and she's gone now. So don't worry, okay? I believe that you were ready, but I still think it's sad. I leave the drawing there, wedged underneath the mailbox with our key. It doesn't seem right to take it. I figure it'll be there for a long time, and then someday it'll just blow away. And that's when I get fucked up. Yeah. (laughs) But the other thing that that she she writes um, is in the very last, basically the very last sentence of the book, is he's a smart kid. And that's one of the things that Laughing Man says throughout the book, sort of like as a, you know, as an exclamation, smart kid, smart kid. Oh, yeah. And you're like, oh, that's from her letter. And then it all makes sense. And I just feel, oh, this fucking book. <laughs> yep. Um. 
So then so, we, sorry, I was gonna, I was gonna t- keep talking. But I, I've talked a lot, and I'm like, oh god, I need to shut my fucking mouth. No, no, keep talking. Okay. Um, I guess like you know, Marcus being the Laughing Man is like the last big twist of the book, mm-hmm. and so she knows now that she needs to write the story to give to Marcus so he can save Sal, which is such a heavy burden to put on him. And I hate that she has to do that. And I don't know what the consequences would be if she didn't. Because Sal was saved. But she does it. And that means that the laughing man dies. And that means Marcus dies and it's awful. And so when he says, you know, you have to do this to save your friend and to save me. I'm like, but but really? Is the saving just sort of having this burden be be done no i mean maybe but like there's a whole so that kind of seems like it could be the end of the book but it's not there's a whole other section where like the police come to the school to arrest marcus yes because they hear that he chased sal into the street um and they're going to take him away and you know either i assume either take him to juvenile you know, uh, ha or to some kind of institution because it seems like Marcus is, I don't know, uh, neuroatypical or in some way, like maybe somewhat autistic or it's, it's hard to tell exactly. It's, it's 1979. So I don't think they have any labels for anything. Right. I think they just, you know, if you seem like a danger to people, maybe they just lock you up someplace. So, so there's a whole thing where, um, <laughs> where uh, Miranda like figures out what's going on and then orchestrates this whole thing so that so that Marcus won't be in trouble. She goes to the the school dentist. Yeah, so the fact that the school has a dentist is like the weirdest detail that ends up being so important in this book. Yeah, and we never get the dentist's name also. We don't? If we did, I missed it. So like she's in the office the cops come in and basically what's kind of clear is that all of the adults in the school like Marcus and are and are worried about him. Yes. So these cops come in and ask about him and the uh, wheelie is the <laughs> school secretary is what everyone calls her because she n- doesn't like to get out of her uh, chair with wheels on it. <laughs> um, so she stalls them. Miranda goes off to the dentist and because she wants to call her, her mom, who works as a paralegal in a law firm that represents, you know, a lot of kind of poor or, or underrepresented populations, uh, I guess I, is how you would put it these days. Mm-hmm. Um, so she goes to the dentist. She calls her mom. All the lawyers are busy, but uh, her mom says that she'll be right there. And Miranda goes to... Gets a note from the dentist, goes to the classroom uh, where Marcus is, and takes him out and brings him to the dentist. The dentist locks the door and basically stalls the police until Miranda's mother gets there. And then she, you know, she uses her law knowledge and ability to get people to do what she wants them to, to get them to go away and back to the office and sort of call the parents and stuff and everything manages to get straightened out um sniffle yeah (laughs) so that's like because um talking about the story of the book like it's kind of interesting that the primary character in this book is not the one (laughs) Like, it's someone who's kind of to the side of the main action for most of it. Like, she she's not going to be a time traveler. Um, she's not getting punched or running into the street. Uh, you know, like she's not directly related to the action, but she's sort of next to it, and she has an influence on it. And this is like the one thing where she's, you know, this is after that sort of fateful New Year's Day when she suddenly realizes that there are things that she can do 
to help other people. And they aren't even hard. They're just things that she never bothered to do before. And and here is where she really kind of steps up. In. And for this guy who is kind of a friend, but not even, even not really, you know? Like, they've had... I think two conversations really. One of them was about a wrinkle in time and she found it totally annoying because he was fixated on this, like the question of um, whether they actually got back five minutes before they left or not. Which he has a point. No, he totally has a point. He totally has a point. Let's just be realistic. But anyway. Um, so they're not even friends exactly, but she... She sees what's happening as she as she intervenes. And so it's like this kind of moment of greatness. Um, and I really liked it. <laughs> <laughs> so I have two questions for you. Okay. One is, <laughs> weirdly, concerning what it is, the less important one. But uh, it sounds like the future is not that great, right? Like the, the laughing man keeps asking what the burn scale is and why the dome isn't up. Like... I guess uh, I guess global warming is still kind of a problem in whatever year he's coming from, huh? Well, I mean, if this was 1979. Yeah. And he's, you know, so, okay, so he's 12 or 10 or 12 in 1979. You know, when is it really when he's older? And we don't know how old he is. And we also don't know... Um, if time travel ages you in any way, shape, or form. Right. So it could be any time between now and like 20 years from now, which ain't great. Yeah. So that was one question is uh, the, the dome. <laughs> um, it's like, I mean, cause it's, cause it's also kind of funny. Like she, he could have, uh, you know, he could have written a letter to the UN or something <laughs> trying to get them to do, but whatever. That's fine. But what he does is he saves a kid's life. Right. Well, it's also, you know what? I, I mean, that was intended to be a stupid little digression, but I also want to uh, to bring this up in the context of a, of a quote that I happened to take notice of, which is um, after Miranda, like Miranda and... Anne Marie finds out that Miranda made up this Swiss Miss nickname for Julia and and is mad at her. Like, think basically accuses her of racism and also possibly of stealing the two dollar bills because she is the poorest person. You know, she and her mother are, live in this crummy apartment, and the other two girls are clearly in families that are much better off financially. Um, you know, so she's kind of lost her friends and she's just sort of miserable. And so there's a section where she says, then I sat down on the couch and closed my eyes. I pictured the world. I pictured the world millions of years ago with crazy clouds of gas everywhere and volcanoes and the continents bumping into each other and then drifting apart. Okay. Now life begins. It starts in the water with tiny things, microscopic, and then some get bigger. And one day something crawls out of the water onto land. There are animals than humans looking almost all alike. There are tiny differences in color, the shape of the faces, the tone of the skin. But basically they are the same. They create shelters, grow food, experiment. They talk, they write things down. Now fast forward. The earth is still making loops around the sun. There are humans all over the place, driving in cars and flying in airplanes. And then one day one human tells another human that he doesn't want to walk to school with her anymore. Does it really matter, I asked myself? It did. Um, and so that's that's another that's another sort of theme in the book in that sense, I suppose, is that you know these things, I mean, whether or not um, whether or not Sal dies is obviously a bigger thing than the ending or temporary ending of a friendship. Uh, but in the grand scale of things, is it such a big thing? And the answer that this book gives to that question is yes, it is a big thing. Um, well, didn't expect to end up there. <laughs> Comments? <laughs> no, I'm good. <laughs> okay. Uh, the, 
Okay. Oh, so the other thing, uh, actually, that that brings me to the other thing I wanted to ask you about, which is like, yeah. So, um, kind of the the book at the beginning of the book, the the claim is that the story begins with Sal getting punched and then no longer wanting to be friends with Miranda. But we turn, we later learn that that's not quite right. That Sal had decided sometime before that that he and Miranda needed to t- take a break, and it was because. Not because he was mad at her or didn't like her or anything, but it was just that he thought that they were taking up too much, kind of too much space in each other's lives, uh, and that he needed to sort of force himself to make other friends, and specifically to have other friends who were boys. Um, So what did you think of all that? Like, Miranda, by the end of the book, kind of buys into it, but I'm not really sure I did. Well, I mean... I, I see it maybe a little bit. I think, you know, when when you're 12, it may be really hard to have your your best friend be someone of the opposite gender. Um and and maybe it's because now he can't talk about can't talk about girls with with her. That's true. You know, so I mean in some ways like, you know, I'm sure she wouldn't really be able to talk about her her kiss with with Curtis with Sal because, you know, that's something you you, you talk about with your friends, your 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 lady friends. Right. And so I mean, I I sort of see it, you know, like he's like I wanted to play basketball. I wanted to, you know, hang out with some dudes and you know, you you weren't getting it. And I'm like, oh, I, I can see it because the fact that he made other friends forced her to make other friends, which I think made them both better people. Yeah. In the in, in the long run. I mean, maybe th- because it forced her to do the same. She, you know, made friends. She made mistakes, but she made friends. Um, she became a better person um, and sort of was able to to write this story in which she has this sort of big shift. And I, I think I personally, I see it. I see, you know, maybe when I was 12 or 13, like maybe, you know, the kid down the street that I used to hang out with all the time, like maybe we didn't do that much anymore because I had other interests rather than just like, being 12 with somebody. Yeah. I don't know. Maybe I was just a dick. <laughs> That's entirely possible, y'all. But I mean, it's, it's you know, as, as a girl who was interested in boys around that age, if my best friend were a boy and I was interested in boys, like, do I tell him about it and be like, oh, my God, now he's going to tell all of his friends because maybe he's friends with this guy. Maybe he's going to make fun of me. Maybe he likes me and then I'm making things awkward. I mean, I feel like he could have handled it better, but I guess uh, when you're 12, maybe you don't handle things like that better no um i your defense is pretty convincing to me so i i withdraw my objection i mean i i see where you're coming from like i, I hear it but i think you know like i don't know 12 year olds really aren't good communicators no fair enough <laughs> and i think it was you know i think it was really funny that um sal's mom like sort of timed it so the painkillers got him talking <laughs> yeah i know that was pretty great it's like, yeah, he, he talks for tw- he talks nonstop for twenty minutes, and then he just conks out. <laughs> and that's exactly what happened. She's like, huh? I wonder if she did. Yes, yeah, she totally did. Yeah, Miranda, she she really did. Um, yeah. So I guess my my question is, um, what didn't surprise you in this book? Because a lot of things surprised me. But what did not surprise you? So when I read the book, um, you know, at the beginning, there are little laudatory quotes from different people. And so there's all these people talking. And so some of which mentioned the fact that time travel is involved. So the time travel aspect, um, I was sensitized to that. And that actually did not surprise me as much as other things. Okay. 
So, I mean, if, if the time travel aspect was not a surprise, does that mean you had guessed who the laughing man might be? I thought it might be Marcus. Yeah. Okay. See, I was completely blindsided when I first read it. And I was just like, what the fuck? But that's because, like I've said before, like when I read books, at least the first go round, I take everything at face value. Yeah. And then I read it again. So that's why when I'm reading a book for the first time, I'm just like, okay, I'll believe whatever you tell me. Yeah, I think maybe I shouldn't read those little blurbs next time. <laughs> yeah, don't do it. <laughs> Avoid the spoilers. Was there anything that didn't surprise you? You know, I think I think there are a lot of things that did. Um, I think the things that did not surprise me were the fact that she, um, she ended up helping Alice at the end. Hmm. Because that was such a, a thing there at the book, like, oh, Alice is going to pee her pants again. Right. So I, I, I was not surprised by that. But I sort of was surprised um, by the the twist um, that Richard and Miranda gave Miranda's mom after she won Pyramid. Yes. And um, I was also sort of like, really? This money's going to pay for law school, like all of it? You fucking 1979. What the fuck? Yep. Right. Fair point. Jesus Christ. Like 10,000. Was it $10,000 that she won? Uh, Yeah. Yeah. That money's got to pay for law school, (laughs) which I mean, I thought it was, it was great. They, they had um, an envelope with, with law school applications in it. And I was like, oh, that's real sweet. Maybe she's going to. Finally give Mr. Perfect a key. What, what? And I think that was something that surprised me, but that also made me feel really good. I think a lot of this, a lot of this book made me feel good at the end, except for that overwhelming sense of dread. (laughs) Well, yes. (laughs) It's like, oh, everything is wonderful, except that Marcus dies. Yes. And that he ran around New York naked and that he time traveled to save this kid's life. That he, oh God, that's, I mean, I just keep thinking like what a burden that what must have been to receive that letter. Well, I feel like he and Julia might not have gotten together without the letter. Well, that, I mean, that's entirely possible, but also I think, you know, it could have happened because, you know, as I read in the quote earlier, when, when she was talking about time travel and using her ring, he was just like, holy fuck, somebody gets me. Yeah. So it's possible, but maybe not as probable if he hadn't known it was going to happen. But I mean, how weird is that to sort of have that foretold for you as well? Like, not only am I telling you that you're going to have to die after time traveling back to, you know, 1979, but I'm also telling you who you're interested in and who you're going to spend your life with. And ah, that's a really tough letter to read. Yeah. So I I feel so bad for Marcus, who probably has a hard time going through the world. And now this is something that he's always going to be working towards. And that's that's tough. Right. But I feel like he has friends now also that he didn't he wouldn't otherwise have, you know, in addition, in addition to Julia. Maybe he doesn't. There are I'm like, if I had gotten that letter from from Miranda I would never talk to her again. I would read what she wrote. I would take it all to heart, but I would never talk to her again. That's too much. I don't know how Marcus feels about it, but I'd just be like, nope, peace out. I'm out. I I cannot deal with being friends with the person who wrote the story of my death. Yeah. Well, I guess that's kind of... I, I mean, obviously it's not in the book, so we don't know. I kind of, there's different ways of interpreting this, so I'm not saying that this is the correct way to interpret it, but where in the first note he says, this is hard, harder than I expected, even with your help. But the help is is the story. Right. It That's That's plausible, but it could also be that because he thought that she did you know when she when he was talking to her about time travel that she did you know she did okay <laughs> so i wonder if it's something they worked on together since they both they were the 
possibly the only two people in the world knew that, who knew that that's what he was destined to do. But, I mean, when it comes down to it, Miranda isn't that smart. Um, she, she was, she may have been bright, but I don't think she was that smart. So I don't know if I would see her as being someone who is working on time travel. I don't think we really see get a chance to see how smart she is. Maybe. Maybe I'm just underestimating her because I'm a bitch who doesn't understand 12-year-old girls in fiction books. I mean, she does figure out all this stuff. She does, but I mean, she had a lot of help along the way. Yeah. Random notes hidden in places and I don't know. I don't know. Maybe I'm just not giving her enough credit. Um, all right. Well, good enough. Is, is there anything else we should say? Um, I think I'm going to just say I love this book. I'm really glad you liked this book. Um, I hope everyone paused and read it and then listened to all of our spoilers, of which there were many. Um, and I think that, I don't know. I, I think this is this is worth a couple of hours of your life if that yeah and i i do want to say like i read it and then i read it again you know like a week later uh in preparation for this and i i would say that i enjoyed it the second time as much as the first time and you know also knowing knowing what it all meant meant that you know, when all the different things happen, I understood their significance. So Yeah, which I think was a little fun because then you're like, oh, I remember that. It's like picking out all the Easter eggs. Yeah. It's like, oh, I'm in the know <laughs> because I totally read this earlier. You know, like Emery only eating cheese <laughs> from her pizza. Um, you find out that, you know, she's on a special diet for her epilepsy. Anyway, uh, yeah, really good book. Um, and I totally recommend it and uh, thank you for suggesting it carrie this is a good idea man this book like this book fucks me up like i'll be thinking about this for days yeah i mean i uh um you know people could probably tell that i was getting a little choked up there just a little bit just talking about it yeah i'm we all know i'm i'm a a hard-hearted bitch (laughs) so it, it takes a lot to get me to cry um but i definitely feel something there's something in, in this cold, dead heart of mine. Um, but it's mostly like, oh, what the fuck? Oh, what the fuck? What the fuck did I just read? Fuck! <laughs> Where you might get teary-eyed. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, uh, as mentioned at the top of the episode, uh, we haven't picked the book for next time yet, but we want you to pick it for us. So, if you have a good candidate... Send it to us via Facebook or Twitter or email. Thanks to the Sentimental Favorites for letting us use their song, Hey There, for our theme music. Thanks to Ear Trumpet Audio for letting us on their network of podcasts. And um, I mentioned, please don't send me at Outer Space, but there are a ton of other podcasts on the network, some of which have been added recently, such as this one. So, why do we love house hunters? Couples with bizarre careers. I'm Hannah. I'm the VP of Marketing for my family's business in the marine tourism industry. Outrageous real estate requests. It does have the break, but the address doesn't even add up to an even number. It has no eight. Adults who don't know how paint works. I'm not a big fan of this paint color, but I guess it's doable. There's so many different colors in here. Like but just keep in mind, we can get it painted. We're Hunting Houses, a House Hunters podcast. Come on in. A proud member of the Ear Trumpet Audio Network. Find us on your favorite podcatcher. So thank you. Uh, as, as Thanks for talking to me, Carrie. It's great. And, and, um, and thanks for the book recommendation, which was, uh, this was a really good one. And, and the weird thing is I hadn't even thought about this book as a contender until I was like, oh, wait, they talk about A Wrinkle in Time. And we're talking about A Wrinkle in Time. Let's read this book. Yeah, I guess we didn't really talk about uh, the fact that we saw the movie. <laughs> um, it was quite um, a thing. We both liked it. I really liked the costuming. And um, so I went with uh, 
couple of friends of mine and one of my friends brought her her five-year-old daughter to see the movie and after the movie um we asked alice you know hey what did you think of this and she, they're like they kicked her <laughs> that was the only thing she remembered about the whole movie hmm. was that at one point she got kicked okay that is not what i would think of as memorable but to a five-year-old i guess that is i'm thinking like the 50-foot oprah yeah maybe flying on a on a witherspoon like i don't know yeah the uh the slate cultural gabfest said uh reese witherspoon turns into a kale salad at one at one point and i'm into that um <laughs> which i enjoyed because I also was in, I was fine with that. That that worked for me. Yeah, I, I went with it. Yeah. Well, Carrie, um, I love young adult fiction like crazy, and I love you like crazy. And uh, thanks. I'm I can't. I'm gonna be seeing you in like what? Uh, just a little more than a month. Yeah, it's gonna be awesome. It's gonna be soon. It's also gonna be fucking hot because I, I I may have mentioned earlier that I live in North Carolina. Mm. <laughs> So we have to think of fun stuff to do and also how not to die. Uh, yeah, I'm in favor of both of those things. We're getting a new AC unit because our HVAC just died. Ooh. So that will be nice. Hmm. And also $6,000. Hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Did I mention that Ear Trumpet Audio has a Patreon? <laughs> <laughs> Pay for my HVAC, bitches. <laughs> uh, oh, actually, uh, if you if you donate at the five dollar month, the higher level, you can hear me my brief reaction to the Ready Player One movie. Yeah. All right. Well, I'll I'll see you in a little more than a month, and uh, we'll talk about a book. Yeah, we totally will. And we'll eat barbecue. Oh my god, and it'll be great. That's going to happen. Give me a call when you get back. Hey there. Hey. Eartrumpetaudio.com. Ideas and entertainment. Loud and clear. <laughs> I mentioned please don't send me at outer space, but there are a ton of other podcasts on the network, some of which have been added recently, such as this one. Insert promo for hunting houses here. <laughs> Future Jake. Um, so Carrie, like, Jake, thanks. Jacob, I think you just gave Future Jake like too much of a burden. <laughs> yes, that's true. You can't do that. Yes, Future Jake, uh, come back in time and prevent me from set leaving you these editing instructions. Oh wait, no, I just started a paradox. <laughs> Uh... <laughs>